Zarati. Hi, I'm Jim Bellinick. As you work within the deafblind community, you will find that a person who is deafblind uses the services of both an interpreter and a support service provider, most often referred to as an SSP. Sometimes two individuals provide these services, but often you will find that the role of an interpreter broadens to include support services. As you watch this video, you will see deafblind people in a variety of life situations. You will have the opportunity to gain an understanding of how specific roles of the interpreter and SSP are similar, different, and where the roles overlap. Interpreters and SSPs may work with individuals who are deafblind as volunteers, co-facilitators, committee members, and or just friends. Whether paid or volunteer, it's important for SSPs and interpreters to know their functions as well as the guidelines for their roles. We will discuss the role of an SSP in the first part of this video. But first, let's listen to a few deafblind people as they tell us how they utilize the services of an SSP. The SSP would give me support and help me with knowing what's going on. It means companion. If the conversation going on in sign language, the SSP has to voice for me. Situations such as conventions. conventions. Where they come to my home to help my wife and myself. Church activities, Church activities for example. And, and when we travel, when we travel out, of out of state. I'm president of Karen and Sharon for the persons with a visual impairment. I use a note taker because it's very hard to communicate with a blind person if you don't, they don't know sign. But note taking has allowed me this privilege to work very closely with them. In North Carolina, if I go to the doctor, I tell the doctor that I need a note taker. It's his responsibility to find one, which I think is helpful. SSPs are very important. They are our special friends and part of our hearts, and together we inspire one another. Yesterday, I went to a craft fair with my SSP just to take a look around. I got to see a variety of different things that were beautiful. There were beaded crafts, clothing that had a lot of details. It was wonderful. I made a lot of friends while I was there, and I thought, what a wonderful experience working with my SSP. Deafblind people need to be able to touch things in order to see how they look, and being with my SSP yesterday afforded me that opportunity. Now that you've heard from a few deafblind people about how an SSP is utilized, Let's take a look at a few scenes. Watch and see what the SSP does. How is the role of an SSP the same or different from that of an interpreter?
is different is that the SSP is actually participating in the activity. You wouldn't see interpreters participating in a meeting where they were on assignment. Another difference is that the deafblind person and SSP enjoy casual conversation. Interpreters might have personal interactions with deafblind people, but these interactions would occur prior to or after the interpreting assignment, not during. Also, SSPs generally work alone, although there might be extended situations where two SSPs are working together. Usually, interpreters for deafblind individuals work with a teammate. SSPs constantly provide visual information. For example, when they go grocery shopping with a deafblind person, they may read food labels, describe what the vegetables look like, or check the prices. At home, they may read letters, newspapers, or catalogs to the deafblind person. When walking, an SSP provides safety information, such as cautioning about construction on the sidewalk, and gives other environmental details as the deafblind person desires. For example, a new restaurant might be pointed out. Deafblind people and their SSPs plan extra time for things such as reading a ferry schedule, buying stamps out of a machine, or comparing styles when shopping. Whereas an interpreter is constrained by time to deliver information, an SSP works under the direction of the deafblind person, meeting the individual's preferences, interests, and personal timelines. In this next section, we will discuss the role of an interpreter. Let's hear from a few consumers about their experiences working with interpreters. An interpreter helps me in class. What do they do in the class for you? They interpret for the teacher that I'm with. I demand extremely competent interpreters. In light of my life's work, my motivation to be effective in public speaking and chatting with people requires that I have good, skilled people working with me. I'm wearing a hearing aid. Now I'm blind. And this person over here is a deaf person, and she's telling me stories about her trip to New Zealand. And she's deaf. And I don't have enough vision to see her signs. So my interpreter is telling me precisely what she is saying. So I can enjoy the story too. I'm curious about her trip to New Zealand. And she uses her voice to tell me what's going on. It's very helpful to me. And I do this quite often when I go to meetings or uh, when I'm with a deaf person. An interpreter is challenged with determining what information from the environment, visual or auditory, is included in the simultaneous interpretation. Knowing the deafblind person's preferences, needs, and interests aids in this decision making. Timing is a critical factor for this decision making in what information, visual or auditory, is included or left out. As you watch this next clip, note the specific information the interpreter is including in the interpretation. Also notice any similarities between what the interpreter is doing and what an SSP might do.
obvious similarity is that both the SSP and interpreter need to match the language and preferred communication mode of the deafblind person, whether the person uses tactual, visual, or auditory modalities. Adjustments may be needed as the environment changes. Variations in lighting and sound quality may require more visual and auditory information or a change in modality. Other similarities include giving sighted guide assistance and environmental information to the consumer. Getting the attention of the deafblind person in order to share the environmental information is done in a culturally respectful manner. A gentle touch on the shoulder is a common cue. Wait for the deafblind person to look at you, then proceed. An SSP is not expected to function with the skills of an interpreter, but an interpreter working with an individual who is deafblind is expected to have the qualifications of an SSP. An SSP and an interpreter must be mindful of the subtle and not so subtle actions and responses that limit a person's decision making process. Take a look at this next scene of a deafblind person and her SSP. They are shopping and the deafblind person asks for some help with regard to color and style. That is visual information. How would you respond in this situation? What influenced your decision? How might your response affect the decision of the deafblind person? After narrowing down the choice to two pairs of sneakers, the deafblind person asked the SSP for her opinion about which pair of sneakers look better. Remember that casual conversations and participation are part of SSPing and it might be tempting to respond, the white ones, they go great with blue jeans. But think again, this response essentially wraps up the decision for the deafblind person. An alternative response is a visual evaluation by saying that you have seen the style and it seems popular. However, visual evaluations also contain judgment. Different people have varying opinions about what looks good or what is popular. Some response is needed. To avoid the question of which looks better would be artificial. What is another response that would include respect and needed information at the same time leaving the decision making to the deafblind person? Well, let's see. The white sneaker you can wear with different clothing. It matches different colors. On the other hand, the blue sneaker is more comfortable and it will make walking easier. The white sneaker costs $55 and the blue 70. Responding on the one hand then on the other hand will guarantee that power and control of the decision stays with the deafblind person. Inform the person who is deafblind each time a choice is available and accept their preference. With good intentions common mistakes are made such as choosing foods from a buffet for the person who is deafblind, answering inquiries from a third party, raising your hand in place of the deafblind person who desires to speak during a meeting, or deciding on the location and position of seating without consulting the deafblind consumer. Follow the lead of the deafblind person as you encounter choices and you will not go wrong. In review, an SSP facilitates participation in everyday activities. An interpreter provides access to communication between a deafblind person and others using the consumer's preferred language and modality. An SSP tends to work alone and has more opportunity to personally participate in an activity. An interpreter tends to work in teams in a formal setting and rarely personally participates. 
It is appropriate for an SSP to have casual conversation during an activity. Personal interactions for an interpreter may occur before and after the interpreting assignment, but not during. The pace of providing information is negotiated between an SSP and the deafblind person. An interpreter follows the pace of the communication set by the speaker. Keep in mind that both SSPs and interpreters need to be comfortable with touch and wear clothing that is conducive to effective communication. Confidentiality is of utmost importance whether you are working as an interpreter or SSP. Additionally, an interpreter should remember that every assignment requires a preliminary meeting with the consumer to determine personal communication needs and preferences. SSPing is a tremendous opportunity for student interpreters to learn about deafblind people and to become more comfortable in various communication preferences. SSPs need to be trained on sighted guide techniques, need to understand the implications of various types of vision loss, and have the necessary communication skills to provide visual information. Skills utilized by an SSP are easily transferred to the art of interpreting, and these skills will be needed for an interpreter working with a person who is deafblind. We hope this videotape has helped you to understand the differences and similarities in the roles of an interpreter and SSP, as well as how those roles are intertwined. We hope you will consider working in this field as an SSP or an interpreter if you're not already. Yes, and we appreciate people working with us who respect us as individuals and understand us as a cultural group. When people speak of the deafblind community, they are not speaking about a place, but of a culture. We want those affiliated with deafblind people, interpreters, job coaches, counselors, co-workers, and family members to be a part of ensuring equality amongst us all. If you would like more information about training or work opportunities as SSPs or interpreters, please contact your state or local agencies servicing individuals who are deafblind.
continue to increase consumer options for communication. Learning about the pros and the cons of adaptive technology will be helpful to you and enhance your skills as an interpreter. We've conducted a survey of consumers and polled them about how technology has affected their lives. Here are the responses. Well, the first thing, when I wake up in the morning, I feel my bed vibrate. I have technology that helps me with answering the door and identifying a smoke alarm going off. If I had a baby, I would use this technology to know when the baby was crying. If I had a phone call in the morning, I would be alerted to that by a vibrating device as well. So it's helped me a lot. There's a special program in my computer that allows me to make a TTY call on the computer. Also, I can receive calls through the computer as well as using the TTY or a relay service. The word processing program helps a lot because I'm able to change standard size print to large print. So I'm able to make a shopping list or other similar things. My job requires me to use a computer to access the DBLink database. And it's a fairly compressible computer, except in two important respect. Since I'm visually impaired, I have to use a speech synthesizer to translate what is on the screen into voice. I also make use of a braille, a refreshable braille display device because oftentimes the speech synthesizer does not, does not always enunciate certain words clearly, so I can use the braille display device to get the precise spelling or the meaning of the words. If I should have background noise that will distract my ability to understand my speech synthesizer on the computer, I can make use of an FM system my FM system plugs directly into the speaker of my speech synthesizer and can be transmitted directly to my hearing aids. Technology has had a tremendous impact on my work. I am now able to generate computer reports utilizing the computer. The advent of email has made it easier to contact people and to network with people. It is just much easier than it was before. In the past, we were dependent upon sighted people for assistance. The DeafBlind List was established in 1994. The list is used by professional people and people who are DeafBlind to network with one another. It's used to gain information and resources, get answers to questions, and enables people to correspond with one another. It's a vehicle for communication. It also allows people to gain information about SSPs, volunteers, and a myriad of other topics. I couldn't have possibly be doing my job 25 years ago, nor could I have probably attended college without the technology that was offered to me. And of course, Living independently would have been difficult without some of the technology available today. So uh, basically, um, the technology that's offered now that were, weren't available 25 years ago had made a tremendous difference in living, working, and playing. The types of technology you will learn about in this program are Braille devices, computer adaptive devices, and amplification devices. As you watch this video, keep in mind that deaf, blind consumers will choose the technology that best suits their communication preferences. Braille devices. Until recently, 
Deaf-blind consumers had little choice in the type of communication device that was used. Earliest devices include the slate and stylus, the Perkins Brailler, and Teletouch. In 1824, a code for writing letters was introduced by its inventor, Louis Braille. The system later became known as Braille. A slate and stylus were used to emboss the dots of the Braille cell, which consists of up to six raised dots. Braille has been adapted to almost every language and is the major medium of literacy for blind people. The slate and stylus is still the pen and pencil for blind people today. 125 years passed before the invention of the Perkins Brailler by David Abrahams in 1950. Using a heavy weight paper, Braille is manually produced by pressing keys on the Brailler analogous to a typewriter. The Perkins Brailler is the worldwide standard for mechanical Braille writers even today. Automation has had its effect on the production of Braille materials. Now, computers with compatible embossers make the conversion of print to Braille a quick and easy process. In 1952, the Teletouch was the first device engineered to enable face-to-face -face communication between deaf, blind, and hearing sighted people. Messages typed on a keyboard appear letter by letter on a single Braille cell. The Teletouch is still used today by some people, however, it is limited because of its slow speed. The Telebraille was developed in 1978 to give deaf-blind people direct access to telecommunications. The TB is a portable system that uses a 40-cell refreshable Braille display which is connected to a modified TTY. Using the phone is part of my life with my friends and my family. I also am able to communicate much faster using the Telebraille machine and the other little machine with one letter at a time. But this Telebraille machine has been my lifesaver. In addition to telephone use, the Telebraille can be used as an interpreting tool. As an interpreter types, the text is converted to Braille on the refreshable display. Using the memory on a Telebraille, a deaf-blind person may control the speed of reception. In 1998, Telebraille production was discontinued. There are other text-to-Braille systems available. Newly developed systems include the use of a laptop computer, modem, and a Braille display. Computer Adaptive Devices In the 1990s, with the availability of computers, the door to worldwide communication was open for deaf-blind people. Specialized software makes daily interaction a reality. Email technology has broken the walls of isolation. Today's computer adaptive technology has many special features. Basically, any task such as note-taking, keeping a calendar, calculating, creating a database, or doing word processing can be performed by a person who is deaf-blind. For consumers who use residual vision, there are many options for telecommunications and face-to-face -face communication. The large visual display is one choice. The LVD is a modified TTY with a hookup for a large print screen. The letters on the screen are approximately two inches high. When used as an interpreting tool, the interpreter types while the consumer reads the text. The LVD comes equipped with color filters, amber, red, blue, or green. One of the biggest challenges in working with an LVD is the sensitivity of the equipment. Other text devices include CART, computer-assisted real-time captioning, and C-Print. CART uses a court stenographer's technology to process and record spoken words. 
This recording process requires about two years of training. CPRINT is a computer program that allows a typist to caption the message of the speaker. This program uses contractions and special abbreviations, and training is completed in approximately six months. CPRINT and CART are common choices for people who prefer written translations, either with or without an interpreter. An additional choice is the use of a computer connected to an ordinary television by way of a PC TV converter. With specialized software, background color and font can be modified. An interpreter is not responsible for setting up the equipment. A consumer, however, may provide specific directions on how support may be given. In this case, the interpreter may be the eyes for the consumer to accomplish the task. In many settings, such as colleges and conference centers, a tech support person is responsible for the equipment setup. Strategies for text interpreting. When text interpreting, there are a number of strategies you should discuss with consumers to accommodate their communication needs. Seating. An interpreter and the deafblind person should work together as a team to make the best seating choice. Logistics of electrical outlets, lighting, furnishings, and other environmental factors need to be provided before the assignment begins. Translation considerations. It's virtually impossible for an interpreter to keep up with the rate of a speaker during a presentation while typing. Some tips for interpreters might be to condense information by eliminating capitalization or punctuation, perhaps using Braille 2 contractions if the consumer is familiar with them. There's a lot of very unusual trees there. There's copper beeches and giant oak trees, and they're all in different phases of fall foliage. Linguistic considerations. An interpreter needs to match the linguistic abilities of the consumer. Consideration must be given to vocabulary choice and contextual information, such as providing examples to aid understanding. Changing topics. When a topic is introduced, the topic can be identified in quotes. Provide visual information. As an interpreter working with someone who has limited use of vision, it is necessary to provide environmental information, particularly in text interpreting. The consumer is concentrating on the screen or braille display and typically cannot access the environment. Describe the layout, seating arrangements, and decor of the room. Give the name and gender of the speaker. If there is a name that may be confused as male or female, a quick way to show de gender difference is by typing M in parentheses for male or F in parentheses for female. Include physical appearance, demeanor, body language, and emotions. One way of giving details while typing is to put visual information in parentheses or quotations. Amplification devices. For those who have residual hearing, Technology can maximize the individual's ability to hear spoken language and environmental sounds. An interpreter may be asked by a consumer to utilize a device while voice or voice over interpreting. Voice interpreting is the process of watching a person sign, internalizing the message, and conveying that message in the target language. Voiceover is the process of listening to a speaker and repeating the message so that it can be heard and understood. Amplification devices are most useful for individuals who have mild or moderate hearing losses. The effectiveness of a device can be diminished when background noise is present, the acoustics in the room are poor, or when there is a large distance between the speaker and the listener. There are three distinct categories of amplification devices, hearing aids, assistive listening devices, and cochlear implants. Hearing aids, ear trumpets or non-electric hearing aids were first developed in Spain in 1657. 
they collect sound in a funnel and direct it into the ear. Although Alexander Graham Bell has been credited with inventing the electric hearing aid, evidence exists that the first was made by M. R. Hutchison in 1898. As technology developed, the size of hearing aids has become smaller and the quality of sound has improved. The process for amplifying sound is now done electronically. In the 1980s, only conventional hearing aids were available. Some consumers described their sound as electronic or unnatural. In the late 80s, programmable hearing aids were introduced. These aids improved clarity of sound. They gave the consumer the flexibility of changing the settings based on the environment. By the mid-90s, digital aids became available. Using a computer chip, these aids provide less distortion. Consumers report a pleasing and natural quality of sound. Each hearing aid contains a microphone, an amplifier, and a speaker. The four types of hearing aids are behind the ear, in the ear, canal, completely in the canal. I can hear a little bit. I can hear some environmental noises like the phone ringing, I can hear my daughter clapping her hands, but when I have the um, hearing aids off where they're being fixed, I'm unable to hear those things. You may have heard a high-pitched ringing or whistling coming from a hearing aid. Okay. This is called feedback. In an interpreting role, you may want to know how to address this problem. Feedback, like all environmental information, should be conveyed to the consumer. When I go to pick up the phone, and I just put it right on my hearing aid, I'll get this loud whistling. You'll get feedback. Feedback. Mm -hmm. Assistive listening devices. The use of an assistive listening device minimizes interference from the environment. By placing a microphone closest to the most important sound source, background noise diminishes. Think of assistive listening devices as binoculars for the ears. The ALD reaches out and grabs the sound at a distance and brings it to the ear. There are four distinct types of assistive listening devices. Hardwired systems, induction loops, infrared systems, and FM systems. Hardwire systems are the simplest form of ALDs and can be used with or without hearing aids. A hardwired system uses a wire to connect a microphone between the listener and the speaker. They are low cost, easy to use, and receive little electronic interference. One disadvantage of a hardwired system is that movement of the listener and speaker is restricted by the wire connecting the microphone to the earphones or hearing aid of the listener. Another is that some hard wire systems tend to break down often. An induction loop is made up of a wire that encircles a person or a room and is connected to an amplifier. Induction loops are commonly found in educational settings. The space that falls within the looped area is called an electromagnetic field. A special receiver called a telecoil is needed to access an induction loop system. Many hearing aids currently made have telecoils. Induction loops are easy to install, relatively inexpensive, and portable. Since there are no wires connected to the listener, mobility is not affected. Disadvantages are that some induction loops have poor sound quality, may have dead spots within the room, and can be affected by fluorescent lighting and other electronic devices. Infrared systems use infrared beams of light that are invisible to the human eye. The transmitter sends the sound piggyback onto the infrared light. The listener's receiver can be worn connected to hearing aids or earphones. An infrared system has a higher level quality of sound works best in large rooms such as movie theaters and conference centers, and many people can use it simultaneously. One disadvantage for using this system is that it works most efficiently in darkened rooms. 
Another is that the consumer's seating choice may be limited because objects in the room can obstruct an infrared signal. An FM system works just like an FM radio. It consists of a transmitter and receiver which are tuned to the same frequency. The transmitter sends the voice of the speaker to the receiver by using a radio signal. FM systems can be used in group discussions either by passing the microphone or using additional microphones. The FM system is portable, battery operated, and can be used indoors or outdoors, but electronic signals from devices such as pagers can cause interference. Cochlear implants. One of the most controversial developments in technology in the 20th century is the cochlear implant. Currently, over 25,000 people around the world have received implants. An implant converts sounds into neural impulses transmitted directly to the brain by the auditory nerve. For some post-lingually deafened people, cochlear implants may provide sound discrimination not accessible by conventional hearing aids. Some individuals who are deaf-blind use cochlear implants for the purpose of hearing and understanding the spoken language, while others, for the most part, obtain information about their environment. After weighing the pros and cons, I decided for the cochlear implant whether it was a four-hour surgery or not, I will have to say that at first, when it was turned on, it was very confusing because I heard many, many things that I was not familiar with. So I was not used to the noise that I heard. My husband spoke, but I could not understand who that was. But now it is wonderful to be able to know my own name when my husband calls me. As time goes on, I am now able to understand a lot more. I can carry on a little conversation with people even though I may at times prefer finger spelling with an interpreter. Strategies for oral interpreting when amplification devices are in use. Seating. Consumers may have a preference in their seating arrangement. One may prefer to face the presenter, still another may choose to sit face to face with the interpreter in order to maximize readability of the interpreter's lips. Others may want the interpreter to sit in close proximity to their right or left side in order to optimize their residual hearing. Some individuals may prefer to have a full view of the room so participants who are involved in the meeting can be seen. In making an assessment of the possible seating arrangements, one needs to consider the type of amplification system in use, proximity to text typing equipment, background noises, possible interference from electronic devices in the room, and the light source. Light should never come from behind the interpreter or directly overhead because it may cause glare and shadows. Clarify. The interpreter can recognize when successful communication is taking place by observing the consumer's nonverbal language. As requested, an interpreter should repeat or rephrase, if necessary, to clarify the message. Care must be taken to speak naturally. Over-enunciating or exaggerating speech production can cause distraction and misunderstanding. Variations in degrees of hearing and vision affect choices that you will make as an interpreter. The priority is to respond to the consumer's requested communication needs. In review, the strategies for text interpreting and oral interpreting are 1. Use preferred seating. 2. Use optimum lighting. 3. Consider linguistic modifications which may include a. Vocabulary 
choices. B. Condensing message without losing subtleties. 4. Use grade 2 contractions if possible. 5. Include visual information. 6. Identify a speaker in group by using their name and gender. 7. Reduce noise interference. 8. Read consumers' body language to check for understanding. 9. Repeat phrase or rephrase if necessary. And 10. Speak naturally. Often, we rely on interpreters' perception of what is being said. The tone of voice, the pitch, and the volume of the spoken word. We receive a lot of information through the interpreter's use of vision and hearing. It is important in understanding the message that we have all these different senses. Technology plays a major role in the independence, communication, and everyday life of people who are deafblind. However, the technology is worthless without you, the interpreter. You ensure that the information is correct and understandable. In any case, the technology alone is flat, cold, and monotonous. You bring the life, personality, and emotions and become our link with the people around us as well as with the environment. That's what technology cannot do without the interpreter. Naturally, technology cannot control our lives. We depend upon the technology and the people, as you've seen in the videotape. Many of the devices you've seen will become antiquated and newer and better devices will be developed. However, without your services as a professional interpreter, we cannot get the best service. We need more than what the machines can give us. We need you. Thank you. with a deaf-blind individual, you may be called upon to act as a sighted guide. Many deaf-blind people travel independently using a mobility cane, a guide dog, 
or their residual vision. They remain safe and efficient travelers by previewing their environment and making appropriate decisions. While you are working, there will be times when a deaf-blind person is in a new and unfamiliar place, and the most efficient way to access the surroundings will be a sighted guide or human guide. When your role expands to include sight guiding, it is important that you have the knowledge and training to perform this task with the utmost care and safety. Standard sighted guide techniques were developed almost 50 years ago in the professional field of orientation and mobility, O and M. Many deafblind individuals have received training from an O and M specialist and have learned the strategies to effectively travel with another person. By following the standard practices that are taught to deafblind people, you and an individual can become a successful team traveling through various environments and situations allowing full access for the deaf-blind person. It is important to remember that all final travel decisions rest with the deaf-blind individual. Travel partners must have open communication and express their concerns or limitations. If a guide and follower have issues regarding safety, they must use negotiation and common sense. The basic concepts for guiding are simple. An individual, called the guide, with the visual capacity to effectively preview and navigate the environment safely, will position him or herself in front of the deaf-blind person, known as the follower, and beside the arm and hand that the follower prefers to use for grasping. The guide offers the appropriate arm to the follower. The follower remains about one half step behind the guide and grasps the guide's arm just above the elbow. The proper grasp is the thumb on one side of the guide's arm and four fingers on the other. The guide's arm remains extended down and relaxed. This allows the follower to interpret information from the movement of the guide's arm. In this way, the team begins to walk. By holding the guide's arm in the proper position, the follower can detect the forward movement of the guide as he walks, turns left or right, or steps up and down. And with this information, both partners cooperate to ensure safe and efficient mobility. There are some basic and common sense rules to follow when performing sighted guide. These rules are important to remember. Always respect the position of the deaf-blind traveler. The deaf-blind individual chooses the left or right arm for grasping. The guide should adjust his or her pace to the speed preferred by the deaf-blind person by attending to the tension on the arm. When the pace is correct, the guide will not feel pulling or pushing on his or her arm. The deaf-blind follower maintains a firm grasp that is not so tight as to become uncomfortable to the guide. Obviously, contact between the guide and follower should be constantly maintained while moving. A guide should never abandon the deafblind traveler in an open, neutral space. When the guide and follower decide to separate, the deafblind individual should have a wall, pole, seat, or another anchor that allows them to know where they are and to remain safe. Safety is a primary concern, and the guide should not enter travel situations if they are uncertain or unable to ensure the security of the follower. The guide should always move forward into space that has been previewed. Walking backward or moving in a way that causes the follower to walk backward can be dangerous. Remember that you span twice your normal width when walking in standard sighted guide position. Be aware of upper body and head hazards along your route, especially when walking with individuals taller than you. If the travel team can communicate by spoken language, then communication between the guide and follower can be helpful during sighted guide. While it is possible to communicate visually or tactually when guiding an individual through open and unobstructed space, the guide and follower should usually focus on their safe and efficient movement. Tactual communication should be kept to a minimum when moving in any environment that presents a challenge or is potentially unsafe. If there is an important reason to communicate, 
the guide and follower might decide to stop moving until communication is complete. The guide should be sensitive to needs and desires of the deaf-blind traveler. Some individuals are very experienced at using a human guide, and for others this may be a new experience. The guide should adjust his techniques and pace with this in mind. The simplest sighted guide scenario is walking in a place that is wide enough for two people and does not change elevation. The follower grasps the guide's arm above the elbow and maintains their connection as the guide moves forward. Remember that the guide must continually preview the environment, anticipate changes along the route, and successfully relate information to the deaf-blind person through the movement of his or her body and arm. The guide turns by continuing to move forward and allowing the follower to feel the turn at the guide's arm. The first challenge the guide and follower may encounter is a narrow space. This may be an open door, a crowded sidewalk, or any place that does not allow enough space for two people to walk through when traveling side by side. When faced with this situation, the guide initiates sighted guide narrow space techniques. While still moving, the guide brings his guiding arm behind him, resting it in the small of his back. At the same time, the follower will slide their hand down the guide's arm and secure a grasp on the guide's wrist. This will cause the team to align single file, making the space necessary to travel only as wide as a single person. To be sure that the guide and follower's feet do not become entangled, the deaf-blind traveler extends his arm to increase the amount of space between When faced with this situation, the guide initiates sighted guide narrow space techniques. While still moving, the guide brings his guiding arm behind him, resting it in the small of his back. At the same time, the follower will slide their hand down the guide's arm and secure a grasp on the guide's wrist. This will cause the team to align single file, making the space necessary to travel only as wide as a single person. To be sure that the guide and follower's feet do not become entangled, the deaf-blind traveler extends his arm to increase the amount of space between him and the guide. When the team is passed through the narrow space, the guide moves his arm to its natural position at the side of his body, and the follower returns their grasp to the position above the elbow on the arm. Another common situation that requires special consideration and care is when the travel team encounters a change in the elevation of the surface, like steps, curbs, or other changes. The guide should anticipate the upcoming change in the surface. It is best to approach curbs and steps straight on at a 90 degree angle. As the travel team approaches the change in elevation, the guide stops. This pause signals the follower to predict a change in the surface. After stopping briefly, the guide steps up or down and visually checks that the follower's footing is secure. In the case of curbs at street crossings, the guide stops, steps, and checks that the follower is safe and stable. The guide then moves forward and the follower detects that they are again on a level surface. For steps, additional consideration is necessary. After approaching the top or bottom step, the guide stops. In an unknown environment, the follower may not grasp the handrail of the stairway. The guide respectfully prompts the follower to take the handrail. Then the guide and follower descend or ascend the stairs. When the guide reaches the level surface, she again stops, signaling to the follower that there are no more steps. At any change in the surface, including steps, curbs, grass, or rough terrain, the guide should always indicate a change by stopping before proceeding. With an experienced team of travelers, the stop may be a brief pause. A standard closed door can open one of four different ways, away from the travel team to the left or right, and toward the travel team to the left or right. There are various ways to deal with closed doors, and deafblind travelers may have a preference for different techniques. It may be best to follow a simple rule. If the guide can control the door, the door swings toward the guide, 
he or she should open the door and hold it open with an extended arm until the follower is completely through the doorway. If the door swings toward the follower, the guide will hand over control of the door by using his hand to lead the follower's free hand to the door. The follower will then control the door until he is through the doorway. Another way to remember this technique as you approach the door is if the handle or knob is on the same side as the guide, then the follower controls the door. If the door handle is on the side of the follower, then the guide will control the door. Please watch these demonstrations and take note which way the door opens, on which side the door handle is located, and who controls the door as the travel team passes through. It is safer and easier to avoid revolving doors. Standard swinging doors are almost always available as an alternative. Some deaf-blind travelers do prefer to use revolving doors. To use most revolving doors, you will need to effect narrow space position and move carefully as you proceed through. Escalators pose potential dangers for all travelers, with or without vision. And again, it is best to avoid using them if you are not an experienced sighted guide traveler. In most places with escalators, elevators or stairways are an available alternative. If you are in a situation where you must travel on an escalator, caution and common sense must be used. If you are unaware of the deaf-blind individual's preference for elevators, stairs, or escalators, stop, explain the options, and ask the deaf-blind individual which is preferred. If the choice is an escalator, approach the escalator and stop before proceeding onto the moving steps. Allow the follower to lightly touch the moving handrail to determine the approximate speed of the escalator. Bend your arm and allow the follower to secure a firm, full hand grasp around your arm. As you proceed onto the moving step, you must visually detect that the follower's foot has successfully and safely set down onto a full step. The guide must use the handrail as does the traveler. Be prepared to support the weight of the follower if balance is lost. As you approach the end of the escalator, step off the moving step and indicate by your body and arm movement that you have reached a level surface. Proceed away from the escalator to avoid pedestrians behind you who are exiting the escalator. Elevators usually do not present problems. The guide uses the call buttons and floor buttons and leads the follower in and out of the elevator. Narrow space position may be necessary, and the guide should be aware that the elevator doors may close prematurely and must be held open manually. Some elevators offer wall-mounted railings or hand grips that can be used when available. When guiding an individual to a chair, the guide should stop so the follower is within arm's reach of the seating. Then respectfully guide their free hand to the top of the chair. The follower clears the seat with her hand, ensuring that there are no obstructions, and takes the seat. At car and van doors, the guide again stops within arm's reach, in such a manner that the door can be opened. Depending on the deaf-blind traveler's preference, the guide can either open the door and lead the follower's hand to the roof above, allowing the person to protect their head, or lead the follower's hand to the closed door handle. Each traveler presents a unique combination of experience and skill. Standard sighted guide techniques may need to be modified in order to remain safe. Some of these modifications are The deafblind traveler may choose to use his or her cane when walking with a sighted guide. Some individuals prefer to use their cane so they can preview the surface in front of them. This typically presents no difficulty except when using narrow space technique or at stairs and doors when the follower must use both hands to remain safe. You may wish to discuss this with the deafblind traveler before providing sighted guide. If the follower has orthopedic or balance problems,
The guide may need to maintain an arm position, bent at the elbow, and allow the follower to wrap their hand around the arm. This provides extra support, but may prevent easy passage through narrow spaces and at other times. If the guide and follower have very different heights, then the follower may choose to place his hand on the shoulder of the guide. Again, this modification may be necessary, but may cause difficulty at closed doors and narrow spaces. Some travelers prefer to visually follow a guide. In this case, the guide must walk in a way that allows the follower to remain in visual contact, slowing down, regularly checking that the follower is safe, and being very cautious when approaching crowds, steps, and other dangerous situations. Poor lighting, bright glare, and other environmental factors significantly impact many travelers with vision loss. Some travelers with low vision may use a sighted guide on some routes or for short periods of time, and at other times decide to use their residual vision. It is always the deaf-blind person's decision when and if to accept a sighted guide. Like any new set of skills, a little practice and time will allow you to become a proficient sighted guide. Confidence and comfort will soon come. Remain relaxed, because a stiff or tense body and arm do not provide good information to the follower. Remember that you are in a team travel situation that requires cooperation and mutual respect. If you are uncertain about what to do, discuss this with a deafblind traveler or consult an O&M specialist. Good luck and safe travel. Thank you.